Welcome to our YouTube channel. We're so glad that you found us. Please enjoy this inspiring interview with Tom Dallas, where he was interviewed by Julie Butler. You can find out more about Tom Doss on his website, tomdoss.com. For more information on our non-dual community and the free resources that we provide, we invite you to visit our website, awakening-together.org. We hope that you enjoy the sad song and hope to see you live in our sanctuary sometime in the near future. Right, well, welcome everyone to this sad song with Tom Dass. And um, Tom, I'll just read a short bio about you um, and feel free to correct anything or add to it. But Tom is a resident of London. He's a spiritual guide who shares a profound message of freedom from suffering and his journey from intense spiritual seeking to the simple unadorned realisation of life as it is offers insights that are both profound and accessible. And Tom's teachings are rooted in the grace of simplicity and direct experience. And he extends an invitation to step beyond illusions and embrace the extraordinary ordinariness of life. So this is an opportunity for all attendees to delve deeper into Tom's spiritual journey and insights. And it's a chance to explore, question and reflect on the profound yet simple truths that characterise Tom's teachings. So just to remind everyone here that you're all welcome to... Um, to ask questions, to uh, contribute, to share what you're experiencing. So you can put your hand up if I don't notice, um, perhaps Rhoda or someone else will, but we do welcome questions from everyone. So welcome, Tom. And is there anything um, that you'd like to add to in relation to that short, short introduction or anything that needs correction? Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you for inviting me here. It's lovely to be here with you all. Um, the only thing I would correct is that the bio is just something to say, you know. So, you know, spiritual guide, spiritual teacher, this is not what I really am. You know, this is just the the um, the tag, the label to say something, you know. Um, the the label on the on the door of my office, as it were, you know, so you know. Uh, is, is Tom a plumber? Is he an electrician? Is he a spiritual? Okay, he's a spiritual guide. We we can go to that door if that's what you're looking for. That's not what I really am. It's not, and in the same way that people who come who approach me may feel they're seekers, they're trying to seek something. That's not what they really are either. What we really are is something deeper than all these superficial labels. But that's that's. That's just the superficial side. We're actually just one. There is no real teacher per se, or guide, or seeker, or guided. But this is, you know, this is how I set up shop, as it were. <laughs> Tom, I've um, heard of a lot of interviews. Um, there are a lot of interviews available online that talk about um, your background in terms of voracious appetite for reading books. Um, bringing back bag full, the suitcases full of books from India, yes. and then you're encountering um, and falling in love with um, Ramana Maharshi. Um, excuse my pronunciation. Um, but I'd love to know um, in the years since then um, how your experience of of life has been, or what it is for you today. If you feel to go back to that time and share more, please do. Uh, but I'm also very interested in how uh, you've deepened into teachings in the last few years and what that's been like for you. Anything you feel to share? Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Yeah. Also, you've been you've listened to a few of my few of my interviews. Yeah, I've got quite a few, I think, now because pretty much anyone who asks, I will accept. You know, as long as we can figure out a time. So over time, you know, you get a accumulation of all these interviews. Um, if you look at my earlier teachings, the way I express myself, it's changed over time. And that's as Tom has sort of realized what works, what doesn't work. Um, you know, the way Tom used to express it was one way, and then he realized, oh, that doesn't work very well, so he changed it. And 
also some aspects of Tom's conditioning as well. So when Tom first started teaching, he didn't use the word God very much. And he didn't mention Ramana very much. And this is because Tom was worried that mentioning God um, might put people off the teaching. He wanted the teaching to be open to, to as many people as possible and not put people off unnecessarily. And um, Tom grew up in an environment where many people were, as, as he calls it, allergic to God. They They may have had some kind of interaction with a church or a religious organization and then fallen away from it. And then anytime you hear the word God, there's kind of allergic, visceral allergic reaction. Oh, you know, I don't like that. So he didn't want to sort of stoke that in people. And also he didn't really mention Ramana too much. For the same reason. He didn't he didn't want it to be a a sectarian teaching. But as he taught more and more, as I taught more and more, sorry, why am I talking about myself in the third person? As I as I um, started interacting with more and more people, these the the desire or the urge to talk about God, to talk about my beloved or Bhagwan Ramana, my teacher, I, it just started to arise more and more and more. And what I hadn't realised was that by not talking about God, by not talking about Bhagavan Ramana, I was also putting people off the teaching because there are a whole lot of people who love that. <laughs> so I think I found, I've, I've found more of my voice as I've been teaching. You know, the, 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 the voice has changed. The, the, the words might have changed. And I was just speaking to someone earlier today, actually, and they they used some words when they were describing their experiences, and I realised, oh, I could use those words. Those words they're using, they're really good words. I'd not used those words before, so maybe I can use those words when I'm talking about it. And so there's an evolution in the way the teachings have unfolded. And what's happened? It's quite it's been fascinating and um, comical to me as well. Is that I've started to teach more and more like my own Bhagavan Ramana, Ramana Maharishi teachers, in, in, sense, in, sen in the sense that I find myself that my teachings are more and more aligned with him. Whereas initially I was trying to sort of express it in a fresh way, or not in a fresh way, just in a direct way. And then I realized, oh, that part isn't working, I've got to change it. Oh, that part isn't working. I've got to change it. That part isn't working. I've got to change. It. And then I ended up speaking more like Ramana, you know. So it's that's been comical to me because you know you end up seeing why Bhagwan taught the way he did. I didn't realize that until I started sharing that myself. In terms of my own experience, it's not changed really. It's just the same. It's just it's just total peace, happiness, love, light always that's it really it's very simple it's very beautiful it's the point of the teaching is to transform your experience into from one of alternating pleasure pain which is called which i call suffering because you're either suffering in pain or you're going to be suffering and the mind knows that the mind often knows oh around the corner there's this could happen that could happen this alternating of pleasure pain this alternating of apparent clarity and apparent confusion this is the characteristic of ignorance or of suffering or egotism and the point of the teaching is to remove that is so we can be happy which is what we want we just want to be happy always and um it just so happens that this happiness that we're looking for is our own, our very own nature, our true nature. So it's it's wonderful that we want this thing that we are. And so teaching just aims to share that quite spontaneously. It shares that.
Is that I answer? find the, um, the blog posts actually that you have as well as the videos yes. very easy to understand, even though they're explaining some concept, um, some, some things that are from, um, originally from Indian languages. And so, yeah, I, I, there's a great resource there. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I forgot about the blog. Yeah, that's a massive th part of, I guess, what I've produced and yeah there's a resource it's a free resource there for everybody all the teachings are available for free on tomdas.com so thank you for saying that and many of these concepts are, are so complicated in terms of the way they're expressed they make people make it so complicated so i try and just simplify it so people can just get the essential teaching in a simple way and the benefit of using these indian words these sanskrit words the sanskrit language is that if you understand a few of these terms, then it gives you access to this whole wealth of literature that's been there for hundreds, actually thousands of years, and that has the same teaching. The teaching has never changed in all these years. The teaching hasn't evolved, hasn't been updated. Maybe the metaphors it uses have been updated, but the actual teaching, the substance of the teaching is exactly the same as it was thousands of years ago. It's just the same teaching. If if it if it what is it if it ain't broke don't fix it that's the saying isn't it so we have the fastest the most direct teaching that was formulated thousands of years ago it gets distorted in every any every generation and then it gets rejuvenated and refreshed and purified in every generation as well you know the ego distorts it and then the the sage purifies it. And so Bhagavan Ramana was one of the most recent incarnations of this. So, yeah. I, I don't know if you know, but the uh, founding minister of Awakening Together is Regina Dornakers, and she um, uh, had a book from by Ramana Maharshi. And one day it seemed to um, sort of start vibrating or the cover started jumping out. And, it, and there was a... Um, that led to to Regina scribing a book, if that's the correct word, which is the teachings of inner Ramana and developing, similar to you, a great love for Ramana Maharshi, whereas before she hadn't had a connection. So, mm. um, yeah, it's interesting. He gets around in terms of, um, and it, I think she said, if it's fair to say, it was like he, he lit a campfire in her heart um, for a while. So, um that's a that's another beautiful book in relation to to Ramana as well. Uh, Tom, I've recently done a course which oh, was called well, Understanding. Just, oh, sorry, go ahead. Just to chip in there, I have a I have a recommended reading list on TomDas.com. Yes, which I highly recommend, of course, that people look at. And I don't include all. There are lots of books written about Bhagavan Ramana. But I've only selected a very few. There are some, there are some popular books, let's say, on Ramana's teachings that are not in that recommended reading list because it's very easy for this teaching to be distorted, even with the best of intentions. So I've just compiled a list of some texts that have as minimal distortion as possible. So just want to, I mean, I, I, any any text that you are drawn to, it will probably be of benefit to you so even if it's not on the list of course books that are not on the list may be hugely beneficial to you but it's also useful to have a list of texts that at least purport to be n less distorted versions of the teaching because there are many distorted mm -hmm. versions that are very that will confuse you if you read them and you don't really understand the teaching i found one of your blog posts in particular very helpful in that regard in terms of pointing to direct teachings and and non-direct as well and yeah that reading list looks very helpful i was going to say i've also heard you talk about purification and if i understand correctly uh, you feel that a lot of purification took place uh before what you may or may not call the the awakening and that was because you were doing a lot of activities you were doing yoga i think you were doing meditation um you were in a loving relationship and so um, a lot of that purification took place before then. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what the process of purification was like for you and if it has, if it continues for you, if there are any examples of anything that you've found 
um, that's come up in the last few years, please? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, these are great questions. These are great questions. And, I, and, you know, it's, I'm impressed that you know about me and, you know, you, you've, you've clearly listened um, to my, my interviews and things. So thank you for doing that. Appreciate the effort you've clearly put in. Um, so, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've done, I, I did yoga and meditation from pretty young age. I was taught as a child. Um, I was taught yoga as a child and meditation too, um, a bit later. Um, was it a bit later? Depends what you mean by meditation. Mantra meditation, I was taught very young. Yoga, I was taught very young. And purification is basically, it's becoming ready to receive the higher teachings. You know, if if so, if I if I when if when I was when I was a I started seeking very young when I was a young teenager. If I heard when when I was a teenager what I'm sharing now, I probably would reject almost everything I'm saying because my mind wouldn't be able to accept those things. It's too radical a teaching, um, and Tom's mind was not ready to accept those higher teachings or the true teachings. So there's a there's a process by which his beliefs are gradually broken down, demolished, crushed, <laughs> or lessened over time. This is purification. It's readying the mind for the true teaching. And if we could represent the spiritual journey as like a, a bar, the first 99% of the journey would just be purification. And then the last bit is just the liberation, the, the knowledge, the, the insight, the self-knowledge. Again, this is just a, a arbitrary pictorial representation. And purification doesn't have to look like what, you know, Tom doing yoga or meditation or something like this. It doesn't have to be like that. Purification is opening of your mind and a quietening of your mind, calming of your mind. So you're able to feel happy, peaceful, and you're open to um, what on the face of it is quite strange and potentially bizarre teachings. You know, the idea that all is one. Maybe if you've been a spiritual seeker for some time, it sounds quite normal to hear that, but that's actually a revolutionary teaching. And people don't often realize, often realize the implications of what that is, what that means. You know, there is only you. There is only the self. The self means you, your true nature. So these are highly radical teachings. Um, they're very loving, they're very wonderful, and they're transformative. But is your mind, is your heart ready to receive them? Well, often not. And you mentioned that I fell in love with Bhagavan Ramana. Um, you may have also heard in these interviews that when I first came across Ramana's teachings, I rejected them. I just thought it was a load of rubbish. And I wasn't ready, you know, and that's fine. That's where that's what happens. And so other teachings were beneficial to me, teachings that I don't recommend now, but they were a part of my journey. So um, on the level of the body mind, there's always an evolution going on, you know, right until death. So you asked me about myself. I wouldn't say there's purification going on now because as I've defined purification, it's about ready to being ready to receive the teaching. Do you see? So once you've received the teaching, there's no more purification. But on a body mind level, yes, you know, Tom is constantly, well, not constantly, I wish constantly, but Tom is slowly learning things <laughs> daily, you know. Um, if he was a bit brighter, he'd probably be learning things quicker. But you know, he he he's he's a bit slow sometimes. So yeah, Tom's evolving, Tom's learning. Tom's changing, and that's that's the way it goes. But that's not really what I am, you know. I'm not the body mind. So I'm, truly, I'm, I'm. There's no more purification going on. But apparently, yes, it seems that there's an evolution and unfolding. Does that answer the question? Is that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. I don't know the correct. Um use of the term but samskaras and egoic mm. tendencies do you feel that that they have been let go on the whole at this point 
Well, liberation in liberation, there are no egoic samskaras at all. There's no ego. Mm-hmm. At all. It's totally dissolved. If there's even a trace of ego, that is illusion. That is duality. And so suffering and fear will persist. And in me, that's completely gone. There's no trace of any ego. And it's not just in me, in you, in everyone. There is no ego now. And this is the reality. There's no evolution or change. There's no nothing partial about it. But if you were to follow Tom around, let's say um, you were um, you, you had some strange desire to um, follow Tom around with a video recorder and record what he was up to in his day, you'd see all sorts of samskaras and egoic behaviors and things and petty things going on, like, you know, having an argument about something that's not worth arguing about or getting upset about something that's happened or, you know, reacting childishly, as well as hopefully some mature moments as well. I don't want to downplay it all too much. You'll see all these sorts of things happening, you know. So in that sense, you know, I would never say that Tom is um, some sort of grand perfected being because it's not about Tom. This teaching is not about Tom. It's about finding out, discovering what you truly are. Um, and Tom is just something quite superficial. And he's, you know, Tom is a wonderful person in many ways, but he's also got his flaws and his foibles and his things, his quirks, his idiosyncrasies. So. And, you know, you, there's, you just ask my wife, she'll tell you, she'll, you know, she'll tell you all these things about me. It feels a very trivial question to ask, but I heard you say um, in another interview as well that, uh, for example, sometimes you have a dilemma when a decision needs to be made and you're thinking, oh, gosh, what do I do? Mm, of course. What does that look like now? Do decisions, do situations just naturally unfold? I ask because I'm facing what feels like a major decision and I'm curious to know what that how that unfolds for someone who no longer perceives stewardship. Yeah, so um, the questions about the, what liberation is like are, the, whenever you answer them, they're always inaccurate. So we cannot really know what liberation is like as a body-mind. As long as we think we're a body-mind or as long as we are relating to spirituality through the vehicle of the body mind, we will not be able to understand this. This cannot be understood by the body mind. So a person cannot come to liberation. It's impossible. The person is like a character in a dream, and liberation is like waking up. So when the when the character in the dream wakes up, they no longer exist. It's not the character in the dream that can actually truly wake up, although it might appear that way. And this is one of the paradoxes. So when you, if you ask me about Tom. We're asking about a dream character. This is not, in liberation, there is no dream anymore. It's waking up from the dream. The dream does not persist. It's only in the view of ignorance that the dream persists. So within the dream, Tom has to make choices in his life. And some of those will be simple. Like, okay, I'm waking up in the morning. I'm going to brush my teeth. That's a choice. Yeah, And I, I, I don't think twice about that. You know, that's something I've been doing for a long time. It's a part of my routine. So that just happens. But then there are other things in life that happen, and it might be very like brushing your teeth that happens every day. It's a very easy decision to make. You don't even notice it because it's so habitual. But then things happen, things can happen in your life which you've got very little or no experience of. So say something out of the ordinary happens or something happens that's just unusual. You're not used to it. Well, now you have a dilemma, especially if there's um, uh, a consequence that maybe have, have some significance to your life. And you might not know how to deal with that. So it's a new experience, it's, an, it's uncharted territory, and the consequences are significant. Well, now the body-mind starts getting a bit frazzled. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. What's the best way? Should I go this way? Should I go that way? Do I do, I do this? Do I do that? Do I have to seek advice? Who do I seek advice from? So all that stuff, you know? And then, you've, then you then you do your best to make a decision. But in liberation, it's not like that. 
it's, it's not possible to actually put into words what happens. It's beyond the mundane. It's, it's beyond the body-mind world. There's no sense of being a person. So all the questions that um, are about liberation that assume that I'm a person, um, is the, the, the assumption is wrong in the first place. You're not a person. And I don't want to make it out like, oh, Tom's this amazing thing. Tom's not a person. Everything I say about me, Tom, is it totally applies to you as well. You know, not a person. We don't, we don't really have a body, have a mind. We don't, we're not really in a world. This is not the truth. The truth is much um, simpler than this. And dare I say it, much better than this as well. It's love. It's total, unconditional love. There's no sense of having to make any decision. To even make a decision is suffering. To make one decision is, suffer is a form of suffering. It's very subtle, but to make a decision is suffering. And so there is no, not only is there no doer, but there's no decision in liberation. Tom, upon liberation, are there any risks? Are there any, is there any way of slipping back or... Are there any things that you have to look out for? Any things that you can have a blind spot about? Or um, because I've read you talk about before liberation, certainly um, that you and that obviously the sages talk about that the need to remain very alert. Maybe it's not applicable to talk this way post liberation, but is there also is that also something that you have to be aware of? With liberation, there's no worry. There's no chance of slipping back. I mean, there's no person who could worry. Worry is impossible. It's an impossibility. It's not possible to have any concerns or cares, meaning cares, meaning worries. You know, it's, it's not possible to suffer. And it's not possible to slip back. If there, there, There's no time even. It's, it's an eter eternal state. It's eternity. Now, eternity doesn't mean infinite, endless time. It means beyond time. It's beyond our comprehension. How can the mind conceive of something that in which there's no time? The mind itself is a function of time. So, yeah. The state that you're in, is it something that deepens? No, you cannot, it cannot deepen because there's no depth there's no um, dimension to deepen implies a progression or a change there's no there's no change it's homogenous it's the same everywhere there's no there's no prospect of depth or time or space so this is so tom has never attained liberation just to make it very clear i don't want you to mm -hmm. think that tom's in some sort of special state no he isn't Tom's just um, a nothing, an image on a screen, as it were. This is not the reality of it at all. This is the illusion. Please don't think, oh, Tom has attained liberation. I want to be like him. Please don't think that. Although that, you know, might be inevitable because I'm, I've tagged myself, I've labeled myself as a spiritual teacher, right? That's why I said at the beginning, this is this is not true. Reality, you are the divine. You are the supreme being, you know. And the point point is, you discover that you will no longer think you are this person or that person. You are Tom or you are Julie. You won't have this illusion. You are the divine. You are God. This is the teaching. Not that Tom has attained God and now you can too. No. There is no Tom. There is no Julie. There is no person. There is only God. That's what you are. The impression that there are all these other people and you are one amongst many, this is the dream. This is the illusion. In your one-to-one -one sessions, I've heard that it can be helpful to work with seekers who perhaps uh, um, they may be doing self-inquiry, they may be doing um, all theoretically that you can do, but they feel that they're not... 
um, they haven't achieved freedom from suffering, so to speak. Um, could you give any examples to the degree that you feel it's helpful of what kind of blind spots do you discover in your work with people one on one? What kind of could you give any practical examples of of things you've been able to point out? Yeah. Awesome. Again, amazing question. Really good question. Um, yeah, mo I mean, okay. There. Let's let's think. Um, let me think about some people I meet up with. Um, and thank you, Rhoda, for sharing the, the details of how you can book a one to one with me. Um, there's so many different things. Where to start? Some, some, some. A lot of it actually is um, not spiritual. Actually, a lot of it's psychological. If I can differentiate between the two, so a lot of people have psychological motifs or notions or ways of thinking that keep them upset, keep them unhappy. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah. Me too. Me too. You know, um, Tom is no. Again, I don't want to come across as holier than thou at all, because you know Tom has lots of these sorts of things as well sometimes. But when I when I work with someone, you often see how just on a psychological level, people keep themselves unhappy. You know, the way they relate to people, the way they're maybe afraid of certain things. People are afraid of often rejection or failure, or they don't feel confident in themselves. And this holds them back. Just forget about liberation, just in their daily life. It maybe prevents them from having the relationship they want. It prevents them from having the job they want. It prevents them from, from doing what they want to do in life and living a full life. It keeps them upset and depressed and stuck. Um, they're not able to process their trauma. They're not able to process what's happened to them in their childhood. So part of what I do is that sometimes. And there are a whole bunch of people in the last few years who have met up with me who don't have any interest in liberation, actually. And they've just been referred through friends and through family members to speak to me. And we just sort out a lot of the psychological stuff. Now, I'm not a qualified counsellor. I've got a lot of experience dealing with people with mental health issues. Um, and if you have very serious mental health issues, I wouldn't recommend you book a one-to-one -one with me unless you want to. You know, it's better to see um, a more qualified health professional. But, uh, you know, depression, anxiety, childhood trauma, abuse, these sorts of things, helping people through that. I've done, I do a lot of that. And so some people come to me say they want to know how to do self-inquiry. But what I do, I just take away a few of the traumas. Of, it take, might take a couple of months. And then their self-inquiry is so much better because then they're not fighting all these deep-seated traumas. So that's part of it. On the spiritual side, most people, you see, self-inquiry, I've written about it, I've mentioned my blog, lots of writings on there, the recommended reading list. Self-inquiry, you cannot learn, most people at least, they won't be able to learn it from a book. It's like trying to learn to play football or soccer or, te or tennis from a book. It's not so easy. A teacher is invaluable. And just a few little tweaks here and there can make a massive difference to your practice. You might not realize you're doing it totally wrong because it might feel great. Or you, you, know, you might be thinking you're progressing. Actually, you're not doing self-inquiry at all, or you're doing something very well, but it's just not going to lead to liberation because it's slightly in the wrong direction or something. So one is just correcting people's misunderstandings about self-inquiry. Um, and the exact correction depends on the mistake they're making. You know, the analogy is, if you're playing tennis, you know, a teacher might say, oh, you should move a bit more to the right when you do your forehand. But that's because you're going to the left. But and for another per person, it might be move towards the left because they're varying too much to the right. So the exact thing you say depends, it's, it's a process of working with the person in front of you. And it's different for everyone. But the other big thing is people's false understanding or wrong understanding of what of spiritual teachings and what spirituality is. One of the oh, you've, I've just remembered. One of the things that constantly comes up is people spiritualizing their life 
I call it spiritualizing your life. So a slightly silly example is imagine that you're sitting in your living room and your washing machine breaks and your house starts to flood. A spiritual seeker will start, will say, okay, well, maybe I should meditate. Maybe I should do self-inquiry. You know, maybe I should try and manifest something. Yeah. Whereas sometimes the best thing to do is get on the phone and phone a plumber. You see, now that's an obvious example. You know, most people wouldn't actually be doing that. Similarly, if you cut your finger or something, you won't be saying, okay, let me do self-inquiry. Who has cut their finger? No, no, hopefully you'd, if it's a minor cut, you'd maybe wash it under a tap and then dry it and put a plaster or a band-aid on or something like this. You know, if it's more serious, you might have to go to a doctor or a hospital. You're not going to try and do self-inquiry. A lot of people, I call these practical problems. You cut your finger, that's something to do with your body. Yeah, you, you, the, the house is flooding, that's something to do with the world. So they, these are practical problems. If there's something going on with your mind as well, the body, mind, and world, these are the material things, the body, mind, world. If there's a problem in the body, the body, problem in the mind, and problem in the world, these they all have practical solutions. So the answer isn't always self-inquiry or spirituality. And people often are looking for spiritual solutions. And the easier thing to do is just to call a plumber or put a plaster on or talk to somebody about your emotions and your feelings. So I see a lot of people get themselves into huge amounts of trouble in their life, financial problems, relationship problems, because they're spiritualizing something that is that we don't have to spirit. Everything is spiritual, ultimately, for me at least. It? But there are some practical things, you, practical solutions people often forget. That's another big thing. And, de and de deconstructing people's preconceptions about what liberation is and isn't. These are the things I usually have to do. Just removing barriers. Tom, um, would it be appropriate, do you feel, to gently lead us in a little bit of instruction in correct self-inquiry? No, I know it's... It, it, it's not something you can teach too quickly, but if you feel to, would you like to yeah. take some time now to talk to us about that? Yes, I'd love to. That would be totally appropriate. Mm -hmm. What could be more appropriate? So I'll say a few things. And do you have further questions afterwards? Or Does anyone else have any questions? We've got uh, still 45 minutes, I think, if yeah, I'm not wrong. We're, Is that correct? We're not, we're not even halfway Rhoda through. Rhoda has so. her hand up. Yeah. So uh, are you saying you'd like to have well, questions and then do this? or? Well, let me, uh, let me say a few things, and then we can go to Rhoda mm -hmm. and anyone else who has some questions. But So it's natural on this journey to ask about um, – so sometimes I have come up with an analogy – of traveling from London to Paris, yeah? And London represents um, just arbitrary names, doesn't, you know, I'm not, I'm not judging London or Paris, but London here represents um, ignorance or suffering and Paris represents liberation, right? And London's an amazing place. I live in London, so. Um, it's natural when you're on this journey of liberation, if we conceive of it this way, journey from A to B, it's natural to ask what is B like? What is Paris like? What is the destination like? This is a very natural question. Oh, what is it like in Paris? Oh, Tom, you're in Paris. What's it like? You know, is there really such a thing as the Eiffel Tower? You know, I've heard there isn't an Eiffel Tower, really. Are you sure? What is it like? You know, this kind of thing. You know, do people really speak French in Paris? You know, I've heard they do, but I can't believe it, you know, or whatever. And then the other thing people do is pay a lot of attention to London, which may not be so obvious, but people spend a lot of time paying attention to London, which is the ignorant state, yeah? the body, mind, and world. Yeah? The liberation is our spirit, our truth, God, what we really are, it has no form. It cannot be understood with the mind. It's totally beyond our comprehension, but, it, but it's what we are. It's what we are. People forget it's what you are. You are that. 
So you are Paris. You think you're in London, but you're not. You're in Paris. So people ask, people think in their body mind, ask about liberation. And that's understandable, but it's not very helpful, actually. There is some benefit to it, of course, and there's there's some utility to it. That's fine. Similarly, people try and analyze what their their psychology, their body, their mind, they try and analyze all this, what's happening in the in the dream. And this isn't that helpful either for liberation. Again, understandable, and we can do that too. And I've already alluded to how I help people with that in the one-to-one meetings I have with people. Dealing with the body, mind, and the world, it can be of help if we can clear a few blocks. We don't want to keep on clearing blocks because that goes on forever. The blocks get more and more subtle. We don't need to clear all the blocks, just the major psychological blocks we need to clear. And then we're, we're, we can go home. So um, most, more important is the journey. How do we go? How do we travel from ignorance to liberation? The methodology. And that is self-inquiry. So the key thing, the key question is really, how do I do self-inquiry or how do I attain liberation? Not is what is Paris like, not what is London like, but how do I blimmin' well get from London to Paris? How do I travel? What is the, what is the method? And if this is the focus, if metaphorically you just put one foot in front of the other and you keep on putting one foot in front of the other and, and you go in the right direction, you'll get to Paris and then all your questions will be answered much quicker than if you remain in London and talk about Paris. Of course, you need to discover the correct method and all this kind of stuff. Um, and part of what I do is convince people or show people how this method is the true method and why the methods don't work. And when you start to realize that for yourself, in your own experience, you see the truth of that, then you naturally start doing self-inquiry because you realize in yourself, oh yes, of course, this is the only way. You understand the reasons, or you not understand the reasons, but you see the truth of it, why this can be the only way. It's not a matter of just blind faith. It's more like, oh yes, I see that. That is the only way. So um, self-inquiry cannot fully be explained in words. That's one problem. On the other side, self-inquiry, we already know how to do it. The, the knowledge of how to do self-inquiry is present within us already. It's, a, it's not quite like this, but it's a bit like how a child knows how to walk. Like you know, a one-year-old child, there's something in them that already knows how to walk. You just leave them and you nurture them and you prevent them hurting themselves and they will, assuming they're physiologically healthy, they will, a young child will teach itself how to walk, right? It's a bit like that. It's actually even closer, this knowledge of self-inquiry is even closer to us than it is a child knowing how to walk or talk. It's even more innate. So self-inquiry cannot be properly expressed in words. No matter how I lead you through it, if you're following the words, there's there's always going to be a problem with the expression in verbal expression. The words can be very useful, nonetheless. But there's a part of you, an intuitive aspect of you, that knows how to do self-inquiry already. And this is this is the truer part, truest part of yourself, innermost part of yourself. And this these instructions, we can hear metaphorically. We don't really hear; it's not with the ear. But we can sense or know the instructions for self-inquiry in silence. If we go deep within ourselves, we can metaphorically hear or feel or discern or intuit how to do self-inquiry. This is a silent teaching. But we cannot hear that teaching if we if we're if our minds are extroverted, if they're if they're obsessed with London, which is the body, mind, and world. When we're, when we're constantly thinking or looking at the world or occupied with worldly things, which means the objects that arise in our consciousness, the world, I'm using the word world to mean the objects that arise in the consciousness, then you won't hear this inner teaching that reels your true nature to you. 
remember to hear God's voice whispering to us, telling us how to come home to him. God's voice is our own voice, because I am God, you are God. I am that, you are that. So really, if if we just relax, be still, and don't suppress, and allow the objective phenomena, that's the body, mind, and world, the BMW, the body, mind, world, to, to fade away, then we come back to this formless essence, formless substance. It's not a substance, but it's a formless thing. It's not a thing. Formless thing, formless substance that we are. And then in that silence, there is a power, our own power, that teaches us what we are, it reveals to us what we are. That is self-inquiry. It's not a path of suppression. We're not interested in suppressing our emotions, suppressing our thoughts. It's a process of falling into the arms of God, falling back, relaxing back into the arms of God. Into the, it's falling into the arms of the beloved, where he'll cradle you, he'll soothe you, he'll restore you, replenish you, and, sh and reveal to you what you truly are, that is one with him. It's an intuitive, wonderful, beautiful, natural process, which we let, we just let go. We surrender. We come home to what we are. Not a path of suppression. It's not a path of avoidance. It's a path of coming home. Now, if we're in a land far, far away from home, and we come home, we naturally we leave the, the far, far away land, right? So people externally can say, "Hey, you're just running away from the far, far away land. You're running away from suffering." Well, it's not running away. You're just coming home to the natural state. But people often misinterpret it. This is one of the other problems that people have: is people try to do self inquiry with their body mind, but the self inquiry is not for the body mind ultimately. It starts off as being for the body mind, but it's not really. Self inquiry is to come back to what we truly are, the eternal, immortal spirit, to find our rightful place on the right hand side of God, which means to become one with Him. Can you hear my kids singing? Can you hear? Yeah. <laughs> Sweetheart. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem. Zoom's got these really good filters now. It seems to filter out loads of background noise, but sometimes, you know, things just cut through. It's quite funny. It's half term break here. This is why I'm able to do the call today at this time. Ah. Normally, normally I'll be at work, but um, the kids are on holiday, so ah. I've taken a few days off. It's all perfect. Exactly. Yeah. Rhoda, do you feel to ask your question here, or um, would you had a question before Rhoda, or would you like to it come in later? Just listening to Tom talk about self inquiry, the questions died. So, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a murderer of questions. <laughs> That's good. That's a good thing. Does anyone else have any questions at the moment? As I said, it a, a, the question came back. As I said, the question died. The question came back. So here we oh, go. I failed. <laughs> um, as I hear, as I, <clears throat> excuse me, as I heard you speak about self inquiry. What I noticed, uh, what I noticed was some fear come up, some um, uh, kind of gut level fear come up. Um, and as I heard you speak about the sense of coming home, that fear started to relax. And what I could tell was there was this, as you spoke about decisions too. I heard you say this. Decisions, this is the way it landed here, was decisions as a form of subtle suffering as well. And so 
what I wonder is how do we block ourselves from the ability to inquire honestly? Wow, Rita, that's they got so many wonderful points in that question. So many insights, several insights in that one question of yours. Beautiful. Beautiful. Let's try and unpack it. Yeah, the fear. First of all, there's the fear. This is good and bad, of course. This is bad because it's a fear, a feeling of fear. That's not pleasant. But it's good because it means you're starting to, it, we're not starting. I don't want to, uh, I don't know. Well, it, you're seeing the um, depth of this teaching. You're seeing that when you start to see the depth of this teaching, in, inevitably, in almost everyone, there's a fear that arises. How many times have we heard that liberation is like death? We've heard most, if you're on the spiritual path for any amount of time, you will have heard this. Liberation is like death. But then death, you see, most of us have some kind of fear of death, of, dis, of annihilate, fear of being annihilated, fear of no longer be existing. The true liberating teachings, they make you confront this fear. The false teachings that aren't truly liberating, they may be very nice and very useful and very wonderful in their own way, but then, then the ones that are not truly liberating don't go all the way. They don't make you confront this fear of death. They kind of bypass it. The true teachings, which may, are, ask you to let go of the body, mind, and world, that, that can scare the crap out of people. You know, That can be very scary. Sorry about my language. That can be very scary. And this is how you know, oh, I'm coming in touch with something that's a true teaching here. It's actually, I mean, it's not the, the sole criteria. You don't want to judge a criteria as being good just because it scares scares you witless. You know, <laughs> um, Some things might be scary because they're very bad. You don't want to go anywhere near them. But in this case, it's an existential fear, I suspect, you're coming into contact with. Fear of non-existence. Fear of losing what you have. Yeah. Fear of a body mind entity losing something, maybe their own life, or maybe their possessions, maybe their loved ones, maybe their world. In liberation, you lose your world. But what you gain is so much more. But because we don't realize, we only know our world, which is the illusion. We don't know what we truly are, which is, you know, it, it's so much better, let's say, so much more amazing than the illusion. So what there's a trade we have to do. We give away the world and we we gain ourself. Because we know the world, we're afraid to give it up. And because we don't know ourselves, we we don't want to let go of the world. If you knew yourself, you would gladly give it up. It's like clinging on to copper coins. Yeah, you know, when you're sitting on a pile of gold. In this analogy, to see to, to see the gold, you have to first let go of the copper coins, and then you'll see the gold that you're sitting on. But we're too afraid to let go of the copper coins because it's all we know, it's all we have. This is what this is what we think of as being our life. But once you let go of the copper coins, and then you realize, oh, I am gold. I am golden. All there is is gold. You wonder how could I ever hold on to these copper coins, these worthless copper coins? It's like waking up from a dream. You know, if you're a dream character in a dream place, you might be afraid to wake up because you're losing everything you know. I sometimes give the example of: um, imagine you you're a um, a princess living on a cloud, and you're wearing pink, and you're married to a husband, and he's wearing pink, and you've got beautiful children; they're all wearing pink, and you all dance around, and you're having a lovely, happy pink life on your on top of a cloud. Yeah, and you're just having a perfect life. You think this is heaven. Yeah. Then you wake up, and you're Rhoda or you're Tom or whoever you are. And oh my gosh, I had this awful dream that we're prancing around on a cloud, all dressed in pink. And I thought that was, you know, you can't. You're so happy that you woke up. But from the point of view of being that princess in the cloud, you might think, I don't want to wake up. I never want to lose this. But it's fiction. So one aspect aspect of it is the fear. 
And this means that you're intuiting what the teaching involves. I said the ego, the ego is seeing, the ego mind is seeing, oh, all my attachments. And that's the fear of losing what you have, losing what you think you have. And then the coming home makes you feel good because now there's an intuitive knowing that beyond this body-mind world, which is finite, we all know the body is going to come to an end, the body will die, and everything we've accumulated in this life will go, will no longer appear to us. You know, you could have accumulated wealth, riches, friends, family, health, um, reputation, good standing in the community, whatever it is, you know, your collection of, I don't know, stamps, Pokemon stickers, whatever you, whatever's valuable to you, it's all going to go with death of the body. Liberation transcends birth and death. And when I say come home, there's a part of you that is, oh, yes, I'm not. See, this teaching is 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 tries to um, resonate with your intuitive knowing of what you are. We all know what we are already. Everybody knows what they are already. It's never obscured the self self knowledge. So we all know that we are divine. We all know we are limitless. We are infinite being. So when I say you come home to that, there's a part of you that goes, oh yes. And then you're not afraid anymore. Because your nature is 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 not to be fearful at all. In your true nature, it's impossible to have any fear. It's impossible for there to be any duality or fear. There's no two. There's no other in liberation. There's no sense of being a person. There's no sense of individuality. Yeah. Now, oh, that might be a bit scary, because because individuality is what you think you are, but it's not what you are. It's an illusion. So the ego is in a conundrum because, on one hand, it doesn't want to suffer. Because it doesn't want to suffer, it seeks liberation, which is also known as happiness, eternal bliss, happiness. So. Because the ego suffers, it, it, it doesn't want to suffer, so it seeks liberation. But the ego doesn't want to lose what it has. And so it's also f- afraid of liberation. It's afraid of waking up. So the ego is in a conundrum. It both wants to be free from suffering, but it also wants to cling to the body-mind and the world. And this, is the, this, is, this in itself is suffering. It's a conflict. And this conflict arises because we don't know what we are, which is eternal bliss. There was another part of your question as well. I've forgotten what it was. What, what did you say afterwards? Can you remind me? Do you remember? It almost feels like you may have answered it, but how is it that we block ourselves from true self There's only one block. And Bhagavan Ramana, his teachings are so amazing. His teachings are so rare. His teachings are very rare. Many other teachings sound like Roman's teachings, but very few are. You know, if you, if you're an expert in something, if there's anything that you have expertise in, you'll start to realize, oh, not everyone's the same. Mm-hmm. You know, like say you're an artist. I don't know. Or say you're a, a, a soccer player. And let's say you can take lessons to teach you to be a better soccer player. You might say, well, they're all teaching the same thing. They're all teaching to play. We call it football, right? We call soccer football. They're all teaching football. They're all teaching you how to play football. And yeah, when you're not very good, you go to any of these teachers and they'll all teach you the basis of football. But once you get very good, you realize that some teachers are teaching on a different level. And Bhagavan Ramana is one of these. They all sound like they're teaching the same thing. But when you go deeper, you realize, oh, they're not. This is my opinion. You you know you make your own decision, of course. You make your own views. I just share what I what I share. And Bhagavan Ramana tells us there's only one problem we have, and this is we think we're a body mind entity. It's the only problem. It's the root problem. It's called he calls it ignorance. Ignorance means not knowing, false understanding, wrong understanding, misunderstanding. We think we're a person because you think you're a person. You value. You care about what happens to your body mind, and you care about the world, which is the environment you're in, the body mind is in. And it's all about trying to protect yourself as a person, emotionally, physically. 
psychological security, physical security. As soon as you think you're a body mind, you will need to have psychological security and physical security. If you think that's what you are, it's normal, it's natural. There's nothing wrong with it. Yes, it's selfish, but that's fine. That's good. You know, if you think you're a body mind entity, it's good to protect the body mind. It's good to seek security emotionally, psychologically. So you have good mental health and good physical health and physical security. But if you are, say you would say you're not the body mind, say that's not what you really are. Let's say you're an eternal spirit that's formless, that's deathless, that's never been born, never been created, that's always happy. If that's what you truly are, then the body mind is just a fiction that arises for a time or apparently arises for a time. And this is, and the belief that you're a body mind actually is bondage. It keeps you trapped to this small thing. The only thing we have to remove is this belief we're a person. Bhagavan calls it the I thought. The I thought or the I am the body thought. If you don't like the word thought, you can use the word concept. The I am the body concept or the I am the body idea. They translate it as I thought, but the word thought can also be translated as concept or idea. So it's the I idea, the me idea, the I concept, the I'm the body mind concept, the I'm the body mind idea. That's the only problem. Again and again, Bhagavan tells us this is the ignorance. There's only one way to remove that ignorance, and that's to discover what you are. Once you discover what you are, all the false concepts fall away naturally. You don't need to hammer away at the false concept to remove it. You just need to discover what you actually are. You know? Once you discover what you are, all the false ideas fall away naturally, effortlessly. This is why this is an effortless, beautiful path. We just come back to ourselves. And everything that is false naturally falls away by itself without us having to worry. So most people who are approaching this teaching think they're a person, think they're a body-mind entity. And so, so the first thing they do is they take themselves to be a body-mind entity, and then they seek liberation. And what Bhagavan's teaching is is self-inquiry. He says, you come to, say you come to Bhagavan Ramban and say, I'm a body-mind entity, help me to attain liberation. Obviously, you don't say it in those words, but that's what you're doing inwardly, perhaps. Let's just say that's what you're doing. You go. You come to Bhagavan, you say, I'm Tom, I'm a body mind entity called Tom, I have these characteristics, you know, I've got this color skin, I'm this gender, I was born in this place, I'm this age. I want to help me attain liberation. Bhagavan says, he doesn't help Tom attain liberation because he knows that's impossible. The body mind cannot attain liberation. He says, who are you? You are not the body mind. You are the self, you are the formless self. Let go of body mind world, you discover what you truly are. And then I'm I'm still hooked into ignorance. I'm still thinking I'm the body mind. So I say, okay, well, how do I, the body mind, do self-inquiry? Right? Maybe I've got a pen and paper. So tell me, how do I do self-inquiry? And I'm about to write down his instructions. He goes, but are you the body mind? Who are you that wants to do self-inquiry? He's appealing to your intuition. Because we know already we're not the body mind. We know we're the eternal. And regular, regular um exposure to his presence has an energy by which we can it will remove all the obstacles. Which is just this one obstacle that keeps on rearing its head in different ways. The idea on the body mind is false. Scary to not re to realize that sometimes. The 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 mind is scared that it might not be the body mind, but once you start to get a sense in yourself of what you truly are, which is happiness and bliss, you let go of the body mind naturally. Thank you, Ryder. Does that answer the question? It does. I watch fear come and go, so. We're just going to stay with that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. You watch fear come and go. You watch pleasure, pain come and go. You watch the body, mind come and go. Mm -hmm. You are not the fear. 
You're not the pleasure. You're not the pain. You're not the body. You're not the mind. All these come and go. None of these are what you are. But we think we're a body, perhaps. I don't want to say that's what you think because I don't know. But we think we're a body. We think when we think, we're thinking. But when we're thinking, we're not thinking because that's not what we are. We cannot think. Our nature is silence. It cannot think. It's bliss. It's happiness. It cannot be sad. Thought itself is suffering. Thank you. Thank you, Rhoda. Any other questions from anyone else? We have about uh, 20 minutes left, just under. Are there any other questions? If not, not, Tom, how do you feel about um, guiding us in some sort of exercise, practice, experience to in relation to self-inquiry? Inquiry. Let's do it. Thank you. So, thank you for being here, everybody. Thank you, Julie, as well, for being such a wonderful interviewer. I really appreciate being invited here. So thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all. Honor. It's an honor for me to be here with you. Let me change my view on my screen so I can see you all. There we go. Now my hands up, raise your hands if you feel divine, if you think you are divine, if you think there's something divine in you. Very good, thank you. Everyone's raised their hand, I can see at least. Some of you have your videos off. We have a sense that we are divine. Everyone here has said that. That makes my job a lot easier. Some people are so into their minds, like Tom was, like I was for many, many years. We do not even acknowledge that. There's a feeling in us. None of these words are right. It's not actually a feeling. Feeling's a good word. Or is an intuition, intuitive feeling. It feels like, maybe it feels like it's in our body. This divine feeling. This um, spiritual feeling. I sometimes call it spiritual feeling. First thing to do is just to connect with this spiritual feeling. Feeling that we are special, vast, immense. Much more than this body mind. Connect with this feeling. It's actually not just the feeling, it's actually our true nature. It's calling out to us. But it, it, when you think you're a person, it manifests as a, an apparent feeling in the body. If we follow this feeling in the body, we'll discover it's actually beyond the body. It's actually what we are. This feeling of, of being divine is actually also can be called faith or love. Because we have a sense, let's say faith, that we are God, that everything's fine, everything's perfect. If you go deeper into this feeling, you'll start to realize everything is perfect. It's all good, baby. It's all good. <laughs> Everything's perfect. Everything's wonderful. We know it. Not with our intellect, not with logic, in our hearts, in a deep, deep part of ourselves, we know. So connect with this first. This is the beginning. This is also the end. 
is to connect with this feeling. That is the practice, self-inquiry. What you are has always been here. This feeling of what you are has always been here. The body-mind world come and go. The waking state, the dream state, these come and go. What you are is always here. And what you are feels good. It feels right. Does it feel right? Does it feel good, everybody? Nod your head or give me a thumbs up if it is. Yeah, good. It feels good, right? It doesn't feel fearful. It feels like you're coming home. We don't have to worry about London. We have to worry about all the negativity, all the suffering. We just have to connect with what we truly are, which is wholly positive. So I want you to repeat inwardly in your own mind. Repeat. You can say it out loud if you want. And you can change the words if you prefer different words. I am divine. So inwardly, in, or you can just know it inwardly. I am divine. My nature is happiness. Say it to yourself. My nature is divine happiness. I am divine. My nature is happiness. I am always here, always safe. Nothing can harm me. I am always safe. I cannot be harmed. Cannot be touched. Nothing can even touch me. Not what I truly am. Body mind, yes, lots of things can happen. Body mind, but irrespective of what happens to body mind, I am whole. I am untouched. I am happy. I am well. I am always well. All is well, and I am always well. This is just my nature. You can repeat in words, or you can feel it within you. This goes becomes wordless. It becomes the wordless feeling. This knowing. This it might be conceptual knowing initially, but it's wordless knowing. You know this wordlessly in you. This is an appeal to your knowledge that's already in you. Self-knowledge, we all have it. Liberation, we're all liberated. We have this knowledge within us. Now, I am not the body. I am not the mind. I am not the body. I am not the mind. I am bliss. I am happiness. We're going to go further. You go as far as you want. We're going to become more radical. We're going to get truer. There is no body. It's just an appearance. Like a dream, like a projection. It's just an appearance. There is no real body. There is no real mind. It's an illusion. There is no real world. It's just a projection. Only go as far as you want to. I don't want to freak anyone out. If you're in touch with your true self, the happiness, then this is very easy. You just let go and let go of all these external objects which pretend to be real. If you let go of everything all these objects that pretend to be real, you'll be left with that which is cannot be let go of, which is your true self. You, it doesn't matter how much you let go, you can never let go of what you truly are. You can only let go of the false, never the true. So never be afraid of losing yourself. You cannot lose yourself. You are yourself. You are divine. You are here. You are safe. You are secure. Totally safe. Totally happy. But you are not a body. Do not think that you're a person. 
There is no person. It's an illusion. There is no mind. It's an illusion. There's just a pure consciousness. Bodiless, mindless, worldless. Without body, without mind, without world. Just a pure consciousness. Just a pure I am. This is what you are. This is the only reality there is. This is the only security, stability there is. This is the only thing there is, is yourself. Pure consciousness without any form. This is why it's called formless. No forms appear in it. If there's any tension in the body, relax, allow yourself to breathe deeply, let go of all the tension, and then let go of the body. Just come back to yourself, the pure presence, pure formless beingness, whose nature is love, light, happiness. And it knows itself without the need for a body or mind or a world. You are divine being. Say it to yourself, I am divine being. Feel it. Don't even say it. Don't even need to say it. Even that's too much. Let go of all thoughts, all feelings even, all sensations. Even let them go away. All thoughts, all sensations are impurities in you. Let them go. Come home to the pure self, devoid of any impurities. Any thinking is an impurity. Let go of any thinking, any thoughts. Any feeling is impurity. If they come, that's fine. No problem. We're not forcing anything. We're not suppressing anything. Just come back to yourself. Happiness within. Just be happy. Go beyond.
I hate to be the one to speak, but that brings us to the bottom of the hour. I want to thank you all for being here and joining us at Awakening Together. Tom, Julie, thank you so much for such a beautiful interview. If you feel to support Tom and the work that he's doing to continue to bring these kinds of teachings, I invite you to his website, which is tomdas.com um, and backslash donate to support the teachings or just to learn more about Tom. Uh, we are awakening-together.org. Actually, we're awakening together. And our website is awakening-together.org. Uh, you're all invited to come and join us anytime we're here in the sanctuary. We are an open assembly. Um, Ola, the interview will be available on YouTube after November the 19th, when it will officially be played uh, for the Awakening Together community. Um, but it will be on our YouTube channel. We'll also give it to Tom to use in whichever way he feels appropriate. Tom, is there anything else you want to say before I hit stop record? Thank you so much. It's been wonderful to share this with you. Wonderful to meet you all as well. And, and um, do be in touch. Anyone who's um, inspired or touched by anything I share, please make contact. Thank you for watching our satsang. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to join us live, please remember you can do so by visiting our website, awakening-together.org. We'd love to see you in the sanctuary. Again, our website is awakening-together.org. Remember to click the bell for more notifications and subscribe.